Hi, welcome to Therapy Unboxed. Today I have with me Joanna Kluwender, who is our wonderful psychiatric nurse practitioner. So I also I have a dual um, certification, so I'm also an adult gerontology primary care nurse practitioner. So I get both sides, both the psychiatric and the medical side. Awesome. Um, I'm really excited to have this talk with you today because, and and we've done a little bit on mood disorders before, but I like to get perspectives from multidisciplinary teams because I think it really helps us all kind of learn more about things that we think we have a handle on, right? Anxiety is one of them. Anxiety is something that people talk about all the time. Today we're unboxing anxiety. Um, and I think I think it is very prevalent. We'll talk about that, especially after the pandemic. Um, and also there's, we can always learn more and, um, get a little more clarity, take a deeper dive because there's a lot under the umbrella. Absolutely. And yeah. we're, we're continually mo- you know, learning more and more, um, as we're kind of uncovering more of how the brain works and what different receptors and what's really involved. And, you know, there's definitely a mental health component to it, mm-hmm. um, where it can affect our behaviors and, our emotions and even our personality, um, but there's also a very much a physiological side of it. Yeah, and so it's really interesting to kind of be able to piece that together with how it affects our behaviors. Yeah. I want to start with this. I mean, maybe it's a common misconception, or maybe it's I don't know. This is just kind of what I've thought before. Um, when I think of anxiety, I think of it being like a fear-based mm-hmm. um, disorder. And I understand a little bit more now that it's a, it's more about worry and like the idea of a potential future threat. Does that right. sound right? Yeah, so there's there's basically when we when we look at anxiety as the umbrella, you know there's a lot of things that fall underneath it. Um, Definitely, you can have panic disorder, um, which is very much fear-based, and it's almost a um, a response of having something happen to you in the past that you're fearful that's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of characteristics like avoidance Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of kind of being stuck in making sure that... um, you don't expose yourself into the same situation to have that panic. Right. Um, and then there's another side of anxiety, which is the worry, worry circuit is kind of what we call it. And it does work actually in a different um, circuitry in the brain, so to speak. Um, it's very much driven by different areas of the brain where fear-based anxiety is very much your amygdala, which mm-hmm. is your um, that's your fear center. That is your fight or flight. That's my, that's what's going to keep me alive. Mm-hmm. And then this worry circuitry is almost a anticipatory fear. What's going to happen to me in the future? And we can, as we get stuck in those loops, it can just continue and continue and continue. And then that's how we get our increased anxiety which eventually rolls over to some physical symptoms. I can see those two things feeding each other too. Absolutely. Like having the prior experience of stress, trauma, whatever, a thing that happened that creates this sort of like panic mm-hmm. piece and then the worry circuitry taking over being like, and it could happen in the future too. Exactly. And all these other things could happen because the world feels like an unsafe place now. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I always see anxiety as self-preservation. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you know, from day one being a cave person and our little lizard brain, mm-hmm. we have been programmed to save ourselves. Yeah. And anxiety is one way to heighten our senses. Um, it can improve performance. Um, it could be very beneficial, but if it becomes too excited or if it becomes chronic where it's with us all the time, it can be very devastating and it can actually have physical, um, issues like heart disease, diabetes. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's good to have a little, but it's not great to have a lot. Um, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned when I talked about tr- 
trauma and I think it was the first episode I was talking about stress and how we're looking at the difference between like normal stress and what ends up being traumatic stress and I'm hearing sort of a similarity right like we can't have a life that has no stress in it that's also traumatic because we don't learn how to like deal um, with any adversity and I'm hearing you say that a little bit of anxiety sometimes is part of our natural human experience it can it can sometimes like get us a little sharper and on point to like handle something yeah so that you know the idea of anxiety is is focus Mm -hmm. right so um you know part of the way we respond and getting that kind of boost of some adrenaline is to really be able to focus in so if we're about to take a test we're going to have some anxiety that is normal Mm -hmm. and quite honestly if you're not having anxiety or a little bit of something churning up inside you you would kind of wonder you know, maybe this test doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. But if it is something that's important, you're going to want to have some kind of some fire under your belly to mm-hmm. so that you do perform your best. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's just if if it gets to the point where we're stuck in a fear based loop or a worry based loop that we can't get out of, it actually has physiological um, implications where it increases your sympathetic, not to get too deep, but um, you know, we have a sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight response. We need this to run away from the saber tooth tiger that's gonna come and get us. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you get stuck in that loop, um, it kind of shuts off your ability to make um, cognitive, rational decisions our problem solving skills go away. Mm -hmm. Um, Our ability to rationalize with ourselves, to even calm ourselves down can sometimes go away. Um, And even, you know, if we get stuck in worrying about the future and what ifs and another what if, and what if that happens, then, you know, you just, you, you learn, you lose that problem solving ability to say, you know what, what is the probability of this happening? That's a very rational thought. And you don't have that when you're stuck in anxiety for a long, long time. Yeah. So it sounds like we there is like a, th- like a threshold, right? We get over mm-hmm. this point and then it becomes a problem. It becomes this loop that you're talking about that mm-hmm. has, has these physiological com- implications and complications and neurological too, kind of getting out of that executive function place where we can kind of reason, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about phobias? Phobias, so they can be, you know, very obviously very specific, mm-hmm. um, but they can be phobias to certain situations, like airplane travel. That's usually a pretty big one. It can be um, in response to a specific animal. It could be in response to um, even certain foods. Um, a lot of people who have had anaphylactic shock are going to have very, very high anxiety around eating certain foods or being in certain restaurants, especially if they've had an experience, a poor experience in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it kind of, the, the phobias live more in that fear-based loop, not necessarily the worry-based. Interesting. And that fear-based loop is, um, you know, when we think about the different um structures of the brain it's very much driven by our amygdala Mm -hmm. which is our fear center but the amygdala is very much attached to our hippocampus and our hippocampus is our memory yeah so when when the amygdala gets fired up because it senses something something i mean we take input in oh something's going on throws it to the amygdala the amygdala says oh hey hippocampus what's going on do we have we experienced this before and if the hippocampus is like oh yeah Oh yeah, this is this is fear. You know, stay away. Is that, you know, that connection may not necessarily be rational because our memories hold emotions with mm-hmm. them, and with trauma and with phobias. Um, maybe that emotion is stronger and can cause a greater um, response than what's really necessary because that emotional component is attached to that memory. So that amygdala just gets hyper, hyper excitable, and it can cause all kinds of other um, responses. One of them goes to a specific part of our brain that increases our heart rate. Mm -hmm. It increases our respirations. Um, It can cause cortisol to be released, which, you know, a little bit of cortisol is a good thing. A lot of cortisol 
huge inflammatory issues. And so that's where our heart disease and diabetes can, can come from or, you know, be um, triggered. And cortisol is kind of known as the stress hormone. You bet. Yeah. yeah. So a little bit's good. We do need a little bit of cortisol, mm-hmm. but, you know, living in that cycle of anxiety and having that cortisol constantly mm-hmm. being produced can be can be damaging to your health, your yeah. physical health. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also thinking about how much, like if we, if we pull away and look at it evolutionarily, how much it makes sense. Like it makes sense that the amygdala would be connected to the hippocampus, yeah, right? Because yeah. to survive again, back to like survival, we need to remember the things that have been dangerous and we need to remember them emotionally yes. so that we react when we need to. It's just another example of these like amazing, brilliant systems that we have in our mm-hmm. bodies that end up maladaptively firing yeah and they're all they're all connected and some of them you know really accelerate Mm -hmm. kind of our response and some actually put on the brake and so you know with anxiety we definitely look at you know how can we balance that out where when we do have a a true which is kind of hard to distinguish sometimes but a true threat we do want things to be accelerated Mm -hmm. Um, and at times when, you know, we, it's uh, our emotions, because it's been such a hard or difficult or traumatic experience, you know, those emotions are going to fire um, that accelerator up as well. And that's yeah. all coming from the hippocampus. Yeah. <gasps> what about phobias that aren't like we can't really connect them to something mm. that's happened in the past. Do have you experienced this? I mean, I'm trying to think if I I know I've had clients that have had phobias, but we hear about this a lot kind mm. of in pop culture and anecdotally about like oh my god, she had a phobia of arachnophobia. Sure. But yeah. there was no like incident with a spider. So, my thoughts on it is that somewhere along the lines and it may not have been a specific spider Mm -hmm. maybe something that looks like a spider Mm -hmm. maybe something that acts like a spider maybe something that was um in a place where a spider may live Mm. but i really feel like there is um there is a memory that's attached to it for a phobia okay in some regard we just don't on we don't honestly know Mm -hmm. all the time where it's coming from um i think that you have to have exposure to something to create um, a connection or a memory. Um, and I mean, that's part of the phobia treatment, right? Is exposure therapy. Mm-hmm. Let's kind of see how, how we react and to slowly kind of become more exposed or become more um, desensitized. Desensitized, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal uh-huh. by experience re-experiencing it right and so um i my thought is that there definitely is a connection Mm -hmm. um to something like i know that i read a story about um there's a little girl who was having a severe phobia to birds and she actually started having agoraphobia Mm -hmm. where she wouldn't leave her house Mm -hmm. because in fear for the bird Um, But it actually turned out to be um, something completely different where she was in school and something happened and there was a bird nearby. Mm. There was something where she associated it somehow. And so then her anxiety would come up about a certain situation or a certain Phobia, but I don't want to go near birds because if I go near birds, then this is going to happen. Yeah, I could see that because when yeah. we're working with trauma, again, with the sort of memory piece, we're not always remembering things as accurately when we're under high stress as we would if we weren't. Right. So their con- traumatic memory is unreliable, although we do remember it emotionally. Correct. Because we want to have that like survival instinct come in. So it's oftentimes very like a very much of a body sensory memory more Mm -hmm. than like a, I was here and I was talking to this person and it was this time of day, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so I could totally see that happening where we would, and it can be told unconscious and that might be why we hear people sometimes say, I don't really know what it is about birds. I'm just afraid of them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, a lot of our, 
a lot of the anxiety stems from having some kind of association and some kind of feeling just emotion something there's something there from something in our past that is causing this reaction usually we don't just have anxiety with brand new and brand new circumstances or situations Mm -hmm. unless we've had a brand new situation in the past that didn't go well yeah right? right so again we still have an association of all right, you know, I tried basketball and went absolutely horrible, and now I'm going to try tennis, and, well, I've had this experience. So it's still Mm experience-based. My next question has to do with genetics. Mm -hmm. Are, Are some people just more genetically predisposed to being anxious? Oh, boy, that's a good question. I know definitely there is genetic components to certain mental health disorders, Mm -hmm. schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. bipolar depression. Mm -hmm. Um, What's interesting about anxiety is that a lot of the symptoms overlap with depression. Mm -hmm. Um, And so sometimes it becomes quite muddled of, you know, you're stuck in this anxiety loop. Is it because your sympathetic system is firing up and we're actually having like an anxious response physically to this? Is it because you've had something in the past that that you're attributing to, you know, this anticipation or anticipated worry? Mm-hmm. Um, or is it depression-wise, you have um, low ability to concentrate, low motivation, low ability to focus, and without having that streamline approach to things, that can cause anxiety. It's sometimes hard to be able to pinpoint exactly what's causing something. And that's why I think a lot of times we're looking at like, what do we do about it? You know, like right, we right. do, it is helpful to know if we can know where it's coming from, but if we can't. And oh, how to prevent it. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Like there's always this nature versus nurture, you know, is mm-hmm. it your environment mm-hmm. that can spark it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Is it genetics that can spark it? Absolutely. Is it both? Absolutely. You know, we, we, we truly don't know. Right. Right. Um, and it's it's unfortunate that a lot of the times we're kind of behind the ball and trying to catch up and treating it mm-hmm. versus teaching skills how to prevent it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit for for those of us who have experienced anxiety, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about what it feels like, um, what, you know, the difference between like a little flutter of like, oh my gosh, I'm about to do this thing and I'm a little nervous all because there's a spectrum all the way to uh, I need to go to the hospital because I think I'm going to die right right so um and it's interesting kind of when you start when we think about those two loops the fear centered loop and the worry loop um that fear centered loop definitely can start sparking off um different parts in our brain that will increase our heart rate increase our breathing um it will cause avoidance so that we purposely will not go or do or experience things. Um, it can cause sweating. It can cause um, palpitations in the chest. Mm-hmm. It increases your heart rate. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, when we think of the um, fight or flight response, um, one thing that definitely happens is um, our eyes tend to dilate because we need to start seeing a little bit better. Um, and our blood actually starts shunting into a different, different way mm-hmm. to get to the muscles to, so that we're ready to fight or flight. Um, yeah. And then there's also a fawn component to it as well, which I think is also a very much a, a safety mechanism where when our anxiety gets so high, the brain will actually say this is too much and you need to sp- push the reset button as I like to say Mm -hmm. and so people can faint they Mm -hmm. can you know be down for a certain period of time they can have um, seizures that are not from specific seizure um, brain um, signaling or activity Mm -hmm. like non-epileptic psychogenic seizures exactly Mm -hmm. and that's all like I still consider it's all Mm self-preservation You know, we, it's too much for us to handle, so the body's going to do something. Um, so, you know, along with increased um, heart rate and increased um, breathing, you can have tightness in your chest. Um, 
a lot of people feel like they can't catch their breath and that they're going to then pass out. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's always the, the thought of, you know, am, am I having a heart attack? Is this something severe? Am I going to die? Yeah. Um, and that can makes it worse. It can. Because you're, then you're afraid, more afraid. Exactly. And so then it kind of feeds into it. Yeah. Right? Um, into that, that whole circuitry that um, just actually, it, it seems like almost an explosion once it starts going. And that might be helpful for people, too, to think, like, am I in worry circuitry am i in the fear mm -hmm. circuitry and that might help us i think do what would like, help, use helpful skills yeah, yeah so let's talk a little bit about that what's what is good to do in the worry circuitry to kind of help us bring that down so when you know when we think of that worry circuitry um you know is it getting back to um figuring out what are we worrying about mm -hmm. And actually being able to take a step back and be able to try and rationalize. Yeah, I'm thinking more like CBT type stuff because mm -hmm. it is a little more cognitive. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Once we get into that fear circuitry, there's not a lot of rationalization that can happen. Right. That's more body. Um, it is definitely more of the physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what do we do about that? Um, you know, is it working on events that may have triggered or have some kind of very, very heavy emotional component to it. And that's now telling our, our fear to start, you know, our fear circuitry, Hey, you get you fight or flight. I mean, this is game on. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely, you know, throughout COVID, I mean, how many times were we watching the news? How many times were we picking up our phone and looking at social media and always seeing about COVID, seeing the rates, seeing the amount of people that are dying, mm -hmm. the amount of um, illness, um, long-term COVID, you know, there was, it, it was, it's severe. And I think though the, the media never gave us a break to even digest. And so I feel like there's a lot that have, that has come out of COVID that's anxiety related. So now we have, you know, the fear of, you know, I've, I, I was sick. Did I have COVID? You know, is that going to spark that off into having a lot of these physical symptoms? Or am I going to be in that worry circuitry where it's, you know, oh my gosh, should I go? Should I go to, you know, the store? If I go to the store, what if, what if I touch something? And what if I get COVID? And then what if I get the bad COVID? And, and what if this, what if I go to the ICU? What if, what if I, what if I die? What is, what are my parents going to do? What are my family going to do? What are my kids going to do? And so we get stuck in that circuitry. Yeah. And so it's, it's definitely, I would say that worry based mm -hmm. definitely responds well to therapy mm -hmm. and to finding the skills of saying, whoa, let's, you know, stop right there. Let's, let's back up mm -hmm. and being able to have, um, the ability to pause. Um, sometimes that medications can help with that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times the antidepressants both work as an anxiolytic as well. Um, so in the circuitry, um, we have the same neurotransmitters, which are chemicals in the brain that help um, certain neurons fire. Um, and sometimes they're firing too rapidly and we need to kind of block the receptors so they're not firing as much. Sometimes they're not firing enough and we need something to kind of get them going. Um, and so, you know, we have um, medications that either help to increase um, or decrease the activity of our of our brain neurons um, so in when we think about anxiety and medications um, we definitely do look more towards um, you know the serotonin norepinephrine component to really help with um, almost desensitizing um, certain receptors so they're not as activated mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the serotonin that's our um, our joy, our contentment, that's finding a little bit of peace. Um, so, you know, that just medications can help. Um, and then it's specifically with, um, some of the physical attributes of, of the fear-based anxiety, the panic, yeah. um, we can definitely shut down 
that fear centered circuitry yeah um, with medications that you know work on specific alpha receptors right um yeah is it true that like some medications are going to be good to kind of take regularly to keep things in check and some medications like we would call them prns right or like yeah. to take yeah. as needed if you're starting to feel a panic attack come on yeah so um you know when we think about neurotransmitters um we are only helping to keep the neurotransmitters around longer with the medications. We're trying to bathe the brain in these neurotransmitters, have them more available so that the neurons can can grab onto them and, and actually use them and be firing correctly. Um, or to grab onto them so that they don't fire as much. So, um, when we think of the PRN medications, um, they work a little bit differently. They work on different receptors and they work faster. Yeah. Okay. So it's great, you know, for symptoms, um, but it's not necessarily treating the imbalance that may come from stress, anxiety, depression, you know, our metabolism in the brain Mm -hmm. increases. We may chew up our neurotransmitters a little bit faster and then our levels get a little skewed um, or really, really low. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when we think of certain medications that are working on neurotransmitters, it takes them a little bit of time to really kick in. Um, Usually four to six weeks to see, um, you know, benefit on a certain dose. I like to say we should see something within two weeks, Um, even if it's just a little something like, oh, I was able to fall asleep easier. Yeah. Or, oh, someone said I was smiling more. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it, but something changed in the past two weeks. Then we know we're at least on the right the right path. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the PRN medications, they, they should work. They should work right away. Yeah, they're um, kind of like as needed. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I'm in trouble, and it's something you know that's definitely there mm-hmm. and that can help. Now, some of the medications can become addictive Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be really careful with that Um, some of them you can um, and the addiction more comes from having like a a tolerance built up to it so you need a higher and higher dose and then you can't just stop taking it because you'll actually have like withdrawal Withdrawal. symptoms Mm -hmm. Um, but there are other medications out there that don't work on that pathway or are not as addictive and don't have that kind of repercussion of withdrawal. Um, and you can just take as needed. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love learning about these different circuit circuitries and I'm thinking about, um, just things people can take away from this and take home. If we're, if we're looking at worry, the, the worry circuitry, we're going to be looking more at, and I'm not going to speak psychopharmacologically because I, well, therapy for right now, we'll talk about therapy. Um, if we're looking at worry, things that are a little more rational, skills that are, in, are a little more rational will be helpful. So CBT, things like visualizing the stop sign, mm-hmm. right, stop, and then kind of walking ourselves back Absolutely. from that loop that intensifies as it keeps going and even learning that we're moving towards that worry loop Mm -hmm. you know and even just you know having that awareness of uh uh-oh you know I'm feeling it's a little different and Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think what you know let's stop the insight it's really and it's a difficult thing to learn yeah especially when you're stuck in those loops yeah and then for the more fear-based circuitry we're going to be looking at things like breathing Mm -hmm. um tip skills dbt skills which is um temperature change so like ice or cold shower hot bath um uh sometimes physical activity so like taking a walk around the block Mm -hmm. or um doing some stretching things that are gonna help us calm down physiologically exactly okay right so those are the kinds of ways we can differentiate the skills and what we can do when we're starting to feel anxious Mm -hmm. um and then uh psychopharmacologically of course we're going to talk to providers (laughs) because we're not (laughs) (laughs) self-diagnosing self-treating but just to know that there are things out there that can be helpful long term yes to help our brains function better and also if needed 
there are like rescue things that are exactly. more short term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, we with any medication, we're looking at, you know, using with caution and using as prescribed. And, mm-hmm. and that's why it's so important to talk to a provider because they're going to get your whole history. And with a person's whole history, they're going to be able to make informed yeah. suggestions. And understanding what are your symptoms? How What does anxiety feel like to you? Yeah. That's one of my favorite questions because I get a different response. And mm-hmm. then I at least I have an idea of okay which which avenue do we really need to look at yeah to help um anxiety versus panic we touched on a tiny bit Mm -hmm. the pan we were saying anxiety so maybe we can clarify like there's anxiety right so the big umbrella is anxiety Mm -hmm. and underneath this umbrella lives panic um worry and actually ptsd Mm -hmm. okay so which is post-traumatic stress disorder um Panic is a, um, it's more of a physiological severe response to anxiety. It has, it's not so much a worry. So it's more that, that, that you're trying to stay away from something. Avoiding. Avoiding. So like avoidance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's all encompassing. Um, panic is a whole different level than worry. Um, worry, panic seems, um, for the most part, can spark up at a moment's notice. It can come about without even being provoked. Um, worry is, you know, something that is those ruminating or those constant thoughts that we're always asking, "What if?" Mm-hmm. And we'll then and then what if Mm -hmm. Um, and we just can't get ourselves out of that thought process that's kind of how I see anxiety it's not that that panic is kind of a subset of it Um, yeah it's definitely I mean it's it's like it's it can absolutely affect your life and so can worry for sure and it's just that heightened response and hyper awareness and um, feeling that you have to be hyper vigilant mm-hmm. and um, constantly be protecting or watching yourself. Um, it can be absolutely exhausting. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned PTSD because I had that in my notes too, that it, it's kind of underneath that umbrella mm-hmm. also because a lot of the terminology and even conceptually what we're talking about has a lot of overlap with trauma work, yeah, yeah. right? That re-experiencing and then desensitizing exactly. piece is very similar. Yeah. And I know in the like most recent, like DSM-5, they've kind of pulled PTSD, like trauma and stress, stress or related disorders sort of into its own category, but it is essentially but anxiety fear. and panic is absolutely a big component absolutely yeah ptsd 100 percent. yeah um and there's one more technique that i want to talk about and this this will help with it can help with panic it can mm-hmm. help with when you're feeling the physiological effects that like increased heart rate um sw- tightness in your chest all these symptoms that you mentioned and it's it is but one of these um like temperature sort of related tip type skills but it's called the dive response and it's where we can um, take something cold so either ice an ice pack or cold cloths and place it um, right underneath your eyes on your cheeks Mm -hmm. and then take a deep breath and hold your breath and do this for as long as you can and you can do it a few times and it it Uh, It sort of tricks your body into thinking that you're taking a deep dive into water. And so it slows down heart rate, Mm -hmm. um, all the whole respiratory system so that um, we can get that moment of reprieve to kind of stop and think and and figure out, am I actually having a heart attack? Right, right. And actually try and get that that frontal lobe to start acting, you know, that frontal cortex. Yeah. Get it working again. Back online. But it definitely will get shut off Mm -hmm. with with panic yeah yeah thank you (laughs) you're welcome thanks again joanna it was really lovely to have you on and uh, like most of these we could talk about this all day um but i think we got to to some really important key points for anxiety and i'm hoping that it's helpful for everyone thanks everybody for listening if you have any questions you can email us at pod at apnlodge.com that's p-o-d at apnlodge.com. Also, you can check us out on our website, apn.com slash podcasts. Uh, Feel free to like, share, subscribe, um, drop us a note. Thanks, everyone.